Welcome to the web. Hi, welcome to the webinar, Cancer, Cervical Cancer Screening and Prevention. My name is Aisha, and I'm the Cervical Cancer Program Coordinator here at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who's been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. We are a compassionate community of knowledgeable survivors, women living with cancer and healthcare professionals. SHARE is dedicated to serving women of all races, cultures and backgrounds and identities because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Huff finishes presenting, we will begin a Q&A discussion. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. When asking questions, remember that Dr. Ha is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Warner Ha is chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and holds the Margaret Cameron Spain Endowed Chair in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is also the professor in Department of Surgery and professor in the Department of Epidemiology in the UAB School of Public Health. His research interests include screening and prevention of HPV-related diseases, as well as, nov as well as novel immunotherapeutic approaches for pre-invasive disease of the cervix, as well as cervical cancer. He serves as co-PI of the Johns Hopkins UAB University of Colorado Cervical Cancer Specialized Programs of Research Excellence. Dr. Hurl also has served on the board of directors for the Society of Gynecologic Oncology and is past president of the eight. SGO. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can someone just confirm that they can see my screen? Yep. Okay. Excellent. All right. So that's a huge uh, honor to be given this talk. Um, this talk will take about maybe 35, 40 minutes. And uh, We'll talk about a little bit about cervical cancer screening and prevention and so just a little bit myself. Uh, I'm a gynecologic oncologist at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, I currently serve as chair of the department. Uh, I came to UAB uh, in 1999 and I'm originally from New York City and really did all my education up in, up in the Northeast before coming down to Alabama. And this largely has become the mainstay of both my academic research and clinical interests. And um, the reason being is that cervical cancer, morbidity, mortality continues to be some of the highest in the US here in the state of Alabama. Uh, we have uh, incidence and mortalities numbers that are four to five times higher than most regions of the country. So this has been sort of a, a personal calling of mine and something that I, I'm actually kind of thrilled to share with this particular group. So these are my disclosures. I serve as a chair for the Data Safety Monitoring Board for a company called Inovio which makes a, a DNA vaccine for treatment of pre-cancers uh, of the cervix. Um, and uh, this is an independent group. And um, I'm not going to be talking about Inovio trials in this talk anyway, but I just want to kind of over-disclose to this group in terms of what I'm doing in, term my, in terms of my relationships with the industry. So I don't know how many of you all know what this is. I suspect some of you all do. But this is the very simple... Uh, 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 diagram of what uh, the Affordable Care Act is, uh, looks like, or, or is famously known as Obamacare. And, um, and so obviously when Obamacare came to be as federal law in this country, one of the major components of Obamacare is through the AHRQ or the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality <clears throat> was ensuring that every single American child or adult, male or female, was afforded screening. And so obviously cancer screening is a huge component of that. And of cancer screening, cervical cancer screening is a significant component of that. And so it's important to recognize that screening is a major mainstay and element of the Affordable Care Act. And to this day, even many, many years later, 
we still wrestle to make sure that screening is covered for all Americans in the United States. Now, what happens after screening is a different issue, which is a different talk for a different day. But we're going to talk primarily about screening and prevention today. So I want to spend a little bit of time about talking about this gentleman, Dr. George Papanikolaou. I'm going to spend about like three to five minutes because I think the history behind this is important. It's important for multiple reasons. But Dr. Papanikolaou, who's famously, his name, last name is uh, coined after the pap smear, uh, basically had transformed not all of women's health care, but also all of cancer screening prevention and control in this country uh, after this seminal article that he published in the American Journal of OBGYN back in August of 1941. And he and Herbert Trout uh, at Wheel Medical College up at Cornell on the Upper East Side, very close where I grew up, <clears throat> basically published the, the first article looking at using pap smears as a screening test or really a diagnostic test at that time uh, for cervical cancer prevention. So the person on the bottom left and the person on the bottom right here is Eduardo Franco, who is an epidemiologist who has dedicated his life to the prevention of cervical cancer, actually took a trip to actually his hometown in the village of Kimi in the island of Evia, Greece, to pay his respects. And so I want to just tell, tell you a little bit about his story. So Dr. Papanikolaou actually uh, trained at the University of Munich and then subsequently came over to uh, the United States looking for work and basically landed a job in a lab at Wheel Medical College looking at the menstrual cycles of guinea pigs. The only problem is that guinea pigs don't menstruate, so it's a little hard to figure out where they are in the cycle. So he basically did what, what we call as vaginal smears, and you can actually do this, and we did this in women for many, many years to figure out what phase of the cycle they were in uh, before we had things like an FSH and LH, and you can figure out what phase they're in. And he was able to extrapolate that and actually use it in women to see whether or not we could detect cervical cancer. What's amazing about this at the same time, you know, he uh, played the violin to make money and pay his pay for his rent at uh, restaurants at night. He used to work at a department store called Gimbals and some of the people on this call may be familiar with that word, to sold, sold rugs, but he was sort of like the classic um, American dream in terms of being an immigrant and coming in and finding work and making a name for himself. And I think obviously the rest is history. And as I mentioned, what he has contributed has transformed how we look at all of cancer screening, not just cervical cancer screening, but also for how we look at women's health. But who's the person that doesn't get enough credit in the story? The person who doesn't get enough credit is actually his wife, Mary Papanikolaou, who's really famous for three things. One is that she's probably the first woman ever in the history to actually get a pap smear. Two, she's one of the world's first cytotechnicians who worked side by side uh, with, uh, with George. And the third one, which I, I've corroborated from multiple sources, that she apparently underwent a pap every single day for almost 20 plus years. And so it's really kind of hard to top that, that, that accomplishment and dedication uh, to women's health. And, She's being awarded the Medal of Freedom from, uh, from I think at that time, the King or the Prime Minister of Greece. And so I think both of them really tag team. And it's actually a shame in many ways that Dr. Papanikolaou never won the Nobel Prize, but the impact of his work continues to be enormous to this day. So one question that we started asking, and I think many, many of the people on this call recognize that we've been doing PAP since really the end of World War II, your grandmother and your probably the, your grandmother has taught that you know you need to get a pap every single year, <clears throat> but in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we started questioning, well, how really good is a pap? Because we really actually didn't know. And so, what's famously known as the Duke Report, published by Dr. Nanda in 2000, demonstrated that the sensitivity of a singular pap, a one-time pap, was about 50%. So for the people on this call that on this on this webinar that don't know what the word sensitivity and specificity are, sensitivity is a direct reflection of the false negative rate of a test, and specificity is a direct reflection of the false positivity of, of a test. And so when I tell you that a test has a sensitivity of 51%, that means that the that the false negative rate is 49% and almost 50%. It's equivalent of a coin toss. Okay. And then similarly, Jack Cusick, who's an epidemiologist in London, 
published back in 2006 based on a pool analysis that again, similarly, the sensitivity of a pap smear is about 53%. So you're probably wondering, how is it that pap smears have effectively reduced the rates of uh, invasive cervical cancer to a rate that was much higher than what we're seeing for breast cancer in 2021 to one in which is literally a rare disease where the incidence of new cases is about 10,000 cases per year. It's because we got, we lucked out. We lucked out and we told women that they had to get a pap every single year. And when you have two normal paps annually, the sensitivity goes up to about 75%. And then when you have three normal paps, three annual normal paps that are normal, this, the sensitivity goes up into basically the mid 90% range. So that's how it worked. We actually were able to get patients in frequently. And as a consequence, we were actually able to use this as an effective screening test and hopefully basically eradicate or basically treat uh, pre-cancer before it ever became cancer. So that's the story behind pap smear cytology. So what we know now, at least in the United States, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Western Europe, <clears throat> is that the rates of cervical cancer has plummeted mainly because of mass screening programs. And so Joachim Dillner, who is an epidemiologist in Sweden, published this in 2008 in the British Medical Journal. And I want to spend a couple of moments here talking about why this one particular graph is important, is that this is a study that looked at women who were screened with cytology or PAP, they're used synonymously, in the purple line. The dotted hashed red line is women that are screened with just HPV. And in the dotted hashed green line is cytology and HPV together what's known in the U US and in Canada as co-testing. And these are all women that had a normal test on entry. They were followed over six years. And then we looked at the cumulative incidence of CIN3 or worse, which is a uh, pre-cancer cancer. And what you can see here is in the purple line for PAP, it's a straight line up. It's kind of scary actually, in terms of the cumulative incidence. And we've known this for a long, long time, right? so that there's a limited predictive value of getting just a singular pap smear in terms of produce, predicting what a woman's risk of cervical cancer is in the future. But what we started looking at back in the mid 2000s is that the red line and the green line were actually not that different from one another. As a matter of fact, they're right on top of one another. And so we started asking the question, what does a pap add above and beyond a negative HPV result? And what we've learned leapfrogging essentially 10 years later is actually very little, right? And this is the genesis for why we are advocating for women to think about getting HPV testing as a part of their screening, or even getting HPV testing by itself as a part of their screening without cytology, what we call, what we call presently as primary HPV screening. So these are all the randomized controlled trials of HPV testing that have been done literally over the last 15 to 18 years. And every single trial on this list basically was in favor of HPV testing over PAP testing. There wasn't a single negative trial. And as you can see, some of these trials basically published in the highest impact biomedical journals in modern medicine, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet Oncology, uh, the British Medical Journal, et cetera. And every single, pay, every single trial show that this would that basically imp outcomes were improved if you had a HPV based screening uh, paradigm for women. To give you an idea, we're talking about over a half a million women in aggregate that participated in these trials because if you all are familiar with screening trials, whether it's here in the US or worldwide, you have to enroll thousands and thousands of women because the events that occur, i.e. cancer or precancer, are relatively rare. Okay, so this is actually a really, really big deal. The other thing I want to point out is that there's really only one U.S. study. Every other study has been done in Canada or Europe. So just keep that in mind, is the amount of work that has been done in the U.S. is somewhat limited compared to the rest of the world. So this is one of the very first studies that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I can't believe it. It's been almost literally 15 years ago. And Eduardo Franco, that gentleman I showed you in Dr. Papa Nicolas' hometown is the senior author for this study. Um, and basically this is the CCAS trial. And this is a randomized trial where women were randomized for screening between PAP and HPV. And over 10,000 women were from Montreal and St. John's were a part of this trial. 
What I want you to focus on the sensitivity, this part. Remember, sensitivity is a reflection of the false negative rate. What they found on a randomized trial, this is the first randomized trial to be published, is the sensitivity of PAP was 55%. So in other words, the false negative rate was 45%. So what I'm telling you is that if I screened a woman in my clinic with a PAP, there's about a 45% chance that the test is wrong. And I think most people on the call would probably agree that's way too high and unacceptable. On the flip side, HPV, the false negative rate was only 5%. In reality, that number is probably even a lot less today. But it kind of gives you an idea of the power and the difference in regards to sensitivity between PAP and HPV. So this is a major study that was published in Lancet Oncology. And this is an aggregate of four trials. The trials come from Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and the UK. And basically, they aggregated all those major trials that I showed you three slides ago and basically looked at women who the control arm was basically pap smear screening. And in the blue or teal arm, depending on what it looks like in your screen, was HPV screening only. And what you'll see here is that in those women that had a negative test on entry, a normal screening test, you could see the marked difference in terms of the detection of precancer and cancer over an eight plus year period. Matter of fact, I will tell you to this group, there isn't a single screening study that has been published in the last 10 years that demonstrates this difference in this magnitude between two screening paradigms, period. And what this translates to is that in women who are screened during their lifetime with HPV, they see up to a 70% lifetime reduction in mortality related to cervical cancer compared to those women that are screened with HPV, okay? So again, I mean, the power of using an HPV test as a part of the screening paradigm is so amazingly powerful that one of the takeaway points for you all in this talk is to make sure that you think about how important it is to incorporate an HPV test in terms of screening women, particularly in the United States against cervical cancer. So, you know, leapfrogging forward back in 2014 and 15, we didn't really think that primary HPV screening, just using an HPV test by itself, <coughs> was going to gain traction in this country. And lo and behold, in 2015, this was FDA approved for use in this country. And so many of the experts, including myself, had a scramble to cr create clinical guidance for the multitude of providers that do cervical cancer screening. So we published this in the Green Journal or Social Oncology back in January 2015, which included gynecologists, geonecologists, pathologists, public health experts, and individuals from the American Cancer Society about how to use primary HPV screening for, to, for cervical cancer prevention. And part of the recommendation at that time was that we wanted to start screening at 25 years of age. And there was a lot of debate that they thought this age was way too young. It's actually not too young after all, but I wanted to show you something that is actually a little bit scary in this country which is that when you look at women who are screened, and this, and this is a trial called the Athena trial, which was sponsored by Roche, which is by far the largest screening trial of its kind ever conducted in the United States, between 25 and 29 years of age, that almost a third of those patients actually developed CIN3 or cancer. And as a consequence, we started realizing that we're probably under-diagnosing under -diagnosing a substantial percentage of women who are in this age group with cervical precancer that can go on to develop cancer, right? The other thing that's really scary is that this group that was studied is an overscreened population. This is a population that probably gets way too many pap smears, not, a, not the population that I serve, where they might get one pap every 10 to 20 years, okay? So you're gonna start hearing a lot more about the changing of age in terms of when we start screening. And you'll see that shortly in the subsequent slides. And what's amazing about this between 25 to 25 years of age, 20, 25 to 29 years of age, 60% of those women, six out of 10 women who actually had precancer actually had a completely normal PAP before that diagnosis was made, okay? So this is where we started really realizing that we had an issue. And what we're realizing is the PAP, although it served its purpose from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
from the 90s on, we're realizing the PAP basically is not performing the way it needed to, and that we were legitimately missing cases of pre-cancer and cancer out in the public. So primary HPV screening is not just unique to the United States. There are multiple countries worldwide, including Western Europe, Australia, particularly of all countries, and I'm gonna talk Australia quite a bit in the vaccination part of this talk, that have really taken on and embraced primary HIV screening. So what this, what's interesting is that <clears throat> almost four years ago, the, the guidelines changed for cervical cancer prevention from the United States Preventive Services Task Force. And this generated a lot of controversy amongst not just providers, but also patients and certain companies that actually made these tests. And what they really were leaning towards was recommending that we go ahead and flip the switch on doing primary HIV screening now and relying less on pap smears. Well, you can imagine when the, the, the screening community in the United States, and you all may recognize this, it does not move very fast, okay? I'll give you an example. So co-testing, which is the combination of PAP and HPV together, which is the mainstay of screening in the United States, that, was, that concept was introduced in 2004. We didn't break the 50% penetration mark of using co-testing in this country until about 2015. So it took over a decade for us to use contemporary screening recommendations in this country. And so you can imagine that things move extremely slowly in the United States. So people to embrace change is not a quick thing, at least in the United States. So as a consequence, after hearing a lot of resentment, concern about these changes, the United States Preventive Service Task Force you know, recommended basically screening from 21 to 65 years of age. And based on these screening recommendations, what they're recommending is that a woman get a PAP from 21 to 29 every three years, if that's normal, starting at age 30, that we basically get screened essentially every five years, either with co-testing PAP plus HPV or just HPV by itself. Okay. I'm going to talk about women older than 65 in a slide in a second because I have strong feelings about this, but we do not want to screen women under 21 years of age, period. Okay. So the United States Preventive Services Task Force is actively revising their guidelines now. So unfortunately or fortunately, these recommendations are probably going to change again in another year or two. So again, I've already talked about from 21 to 65 years of age. And I'm going to move on, but this is the American Cancer Society recommendations that just recently came out uh, basically a year and a half ago. And what you're going to see is some pretty marked changes, but somewhat consistent with what the task force is trying to accomplish, which is now we're recommending that you're not screen women uh, below 25 years of age. And I don't know how many people on this call have any familiar with gynecology. It was literally 10 years ago when we were screening women at 18 years of age or within three years of sexual activity. That no longer applies. And you're probably thinking, why are we bumping the age up? And so this probably has glimmers of what, of what we've been talking about in terms of breast cancer screening. The reason is, is that under 25 years of age, the rate of cervical cancer is exceedingly rare and uncommon. It's, a, it's basically a rare reportable diagnosis. But more importantly, that a lot of those cancers are unscreenable. You could screen those patients, but they're still gonna pop up and you're gonna likely miss them, right? And what we're trying to minimize are procedures that can affect women's fertility if you wind up screening women under 25 years of age. And I can tell you personally, as a referral specialist, it is scary the number of women that I've taken care of under 25 who basically have no cervix and A, they can't get pregnant, or B, if they do get pregnant, they're at extraordinarily high risk for preterm labor during the course of their pregnancy, okay? Then 25 to 20, 65 years of age, we start screening at 25 with an HV test alone. However, you can do cytology alone or you could do co-testing. And so these options are available to you all, but what you're seeing here is a quick change and preference to rely only on HPV. And again, the reason is that we're recognizing that cytology or PAP does not add that much more above and beyond an HPV test. And what I want you all to recognize is that most women in this country, 
90% plus will test HPV negative. The predictive value of that for an individual woman is so powerful. Matter of fact, you could almost argue that you don't need to screen that woman every 10 years in this country. But when you tell a woman that their HPV negative is a part of their cervical cancer screening, there is considerable reassurance that that patient is going to do well over the long haul in regards to cervical cancer prevention. So, you know, I put this slide in because I'm a huge fan of uh, the New Yorker and New Yorker cartoons. I've always, I have one of those uh, peel away 365-day uh, uh, New Yorker cartoon things on my desk and just opened the new one for this new year. But this isn't just an ivory tower kind of thing. I want to show you this curve, and this may take a little bit of explaining. So the positive predictive value is the likelihood that when a test is positive, the patient has the disease. And what we know is positive predictive value is always dependent on the prevalence or how much disease is out there. And what I can tell you is that basically the prevalence of cervical cancer, precancer has plummeted in this country. That's a good thing, right? It's because of mass screening and now partly because of vaccination. So if this is the, if we basically, if this is the, the rate of HPV positivity or uh, basically in this, in this country, and we vaccinate at a 50% level, and then we vaccinate at a 75% level, that this kind of gives you a sense on this blue line, which is actually the performance for pap smears. You can see the steep drop off in the performance of pap smears if we vaccinate more and more women, okay? So this is the other takeaway point for this group. The more we vaccinate, which we will, that number gets higher every single year, a pap smear will no longer be effective in screening women against cervical cancer. And that's the takeaway message I want this group to get, okay? To understand if you rely on the pap going forward, that that pap will miss disease. I can 100% guarantee it, so, okay? And I'm sure you guys will have questions about this in the rest of the talk. So do you need screening after vaccination? The, the answer is 100%, yes, you do. And part of it is because remember back in 2006, the vaccine at that time only included four types and two of the major types that cause cervical cancer, even though we have a nine type vaccine, women still need to be screened. Although this may change down the road as you'll see shortly. But the question is how do we change that? And what's important for this group to understand? So, um, you know, as I mentioned, I spent like my entire career dedicated to cervical cancer prevention and screening, which includes screening, vaccination, treatment, et cetera. So I go to a lot of HPV meetings. And so I was in this HPV meeting in Malmo, Sweden, where I was walking through the poster session and I saw this poster. And I, I went and I looked at it and I chuckled and I went back and took a picture of it because I was like, wow, this meeting will accept any form of research to get its registration numbers. And actually I read the art, read the poster and it was, it's brilliant. And as a consequence, I got to read, meet Basil Donovan, in, who's from Australia, who is an amazing surveillance uh, specialist in Australia when it comes to HIV-related diseases, which kind of has launched the rest of my talk. And I credit Dr. Donovan for sharing some of his slides with me. But you know, when I created this talk, I, this is all pre-COVID, this talk was originally created in about, this slide was originally created out maybe 2014 or 15 gives you a sense of how old it is. And it's quite ironic that vaccines are very political, particularly in the era of COVID. And I don't think there's a single person who's on this presentation listening to this webinar that would disagree that vaccines aren't political. It's probably the most political healthcare thing that we do, you, not just now, but literally 10 years ago, okay? So I wanna put things into some perspective for you all. And this is not about COVID, this is just about vaccination in general because we got a lot of resistance against vaccination. So what people probably don't realize is this, smallpox. Smallpox literally disfigured and killed almost a quarter of all humanity as we know it today. So in the 20th century alone, it's responsible for over 200 million deaths. It makes COVID look like nothing, basically, right? And so where are we, where are we with smallpox today? Smallpox has been completely 100% eradicated from the world. And why? It's because of vaccination, okay? In fact, there are only two strains of smallpox that are available in the world. One at the CDC and one in a lab in Russia 
and they are maintained because of the war, the concern of bioweaponization of smallpox uh, worldwide and globally. And matter of fact, I have I have a smallpox scar in my arm. There are probably a lot of people who are on this webinar who are not even vaccinated against smallpox. Why? Because the disease has been eradicated. Okay, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And one of the things that concerns me is this is a classic out of sight, out of mind. People in the public just don't understand what impact vaccines have had on the welfare of people in this country as well as globally. So this is a slide that's really important, that's impactful. So these are all diseases that we have vaccines for, okay? And then pre-vaccine in this column, this kind of gives you an idea in the US, the annual reported cases pre-vaccine. And then you leapfrog post-vaccine, you can see the degree of efficacy on this far right column, okay? I want you all to hear this. More people, okay, in 1900 died from these diseases from car than from cardiovascular disease and cardiac disease combined, okay? And people in this country don't realize that, right? They think that vaccines are unfortunately an intrusion on their, pub on their personal welfare. It is so far from the truth. And I just wanna make sure that people understand we wouldn't be where we are today if it were not for the impact of vaccines, both globally, but as well as the United States. And I think you remember this, this was actually pre-COVID. This was published in the New York Times where we started seeing an outbreak of measles in Brooklyn, in um, Rockland County, New York, in Southern California. And these were pockets of populations that were not vac vaccinated against measles. And if you talk to any of the people that recently were diagnosed with measles who were vaccinated, they were miserable. Their quality of life is still is suffering today, right? So again, I just, I just, I beg people to think about vaccines under a different scope and for them to understand that many of our loved ones would not be here today and ourselves if it were not for vaccination. So I wanna credit some individuals who I think deserve <coughs> really our true considerable gratitude. And the first one is Professor Harold Zerhausen, who is uh, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine back in 2008, because he's really the one that's credited for linking HPV with cervical cancer. And again, the vast majority of cervical cancers, at least 90% of them have actually sequenceable HPV DNA. And he's the one that made this link. Interestingly, years past, we used to think herpes simplex virus was the causative viral agent, but it's not. It's actually uh, HPV. And these are individuals, all four groups who have a significant hand in developing the HPV vaccine. So this is Professor uh, Ian Frazier, who actually holds the main patent for the vaccine. This is actually a real magazine cover, by the way. And Professor Frazier, who is the most self-effacing man I think hates this article, this cover, because he ma makes him look like a misogynist. But again, he really is at that time was like the Steve Jobs of cancer prevention for really discovering how to create this vaccine. The group Georgetown, including Dick Schlegel, who's a pathologist, group at the University of Rochester, and then Doug Lowy and John Schiller, who are at the, are at the N N NCI at the NIH. All four of them actually had a huge role in developing the HIV vaccine. Interestingly, when you have intellectual property, you get into a bunch of patent lawsuits. And unfortunately, we fought for over 15 years deciding who really held the IP. Ultimately, Professor Ian Fraser run, won, the, won the patent rights to this. But I actually have a separate talk where I talk about this journey and how much this interfered with our goal for cervical cancer prevention. But again, that's a different talk for a different day. But again, so much so that Doug Lowy, who at one point was the interim director for the NCI and John Schiller won the Lasker DeBakey Award back in 2017, which is really what we affectionately call the American Nobel Prize for Medicine. And really they have contributed so enormously and they have been such stalwarts for why we need to vaccinate people, not only in the US and worldwide. And in fact, Dr. Schiller was quoted by saying, when we started this work, there was no greater optimism for an HPV vaccine than there, were, than there was for an HIV vaccine. 
In fact, there was skepticism that it could work at all. And I will just tell you point blank that the HPV vaccine is one of the most effective, powerful vaccines that we have in modern medicine. And we know that over and over again, okay? So again, the vaccine, basically it's what's known as the L1 protein, which is the main protein that coats the HPV virion. When you put this in a dish, it actually auto self assembles to create what's known as a virus-like particle. There is no DNA here. So it's not a non-infectious particle, but the technology behind this is absolutely incredible and it's amazing. And it, it, it generates an immune response like you wouldn't believe, so much so that other companies are looking at this as a backbone for other vaccines and other therapeutics. And again, one thing I, I wanna talk to this group as you may or may not realize is that back in 2018, God, it's already been four years, that the vaccine is now extended up to 45 years of age, what we call, affectionately call uh, mid-adult, mid-adults. I made the mistake of using older individuals and I was much younger. So I'm, I'm actually older than a mid-adult, but up to 45 years of age, the vaccine is approved. So I wanna just talk a little bit about the storm that occurred in Australia and why this is really important for you guys to think about this. So back in 2006, the same year the vaccine was approved in the United States, the Merck vaccine, in Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Administration approved the quadrivalent HPV vaccine. They had this iconic inventor, someone that was being equated with Steve Jobs, really famous guy, but their version of the ACIP, the NIP, actually rejected approval of the vaccine and for it to be distributed to the citizens of Australia. So this is Tony Abbott. <coughs> I picked the most unflattering picture that I could find on Google. I think I found it. And it's amazing what you can find. But Tony Abbott at that time was the women's, was the health minister, was very much against women's health. He then become, became an ousted prime minister in Australia. And he was doing really well with his budget and basically would not sign off on the HPV vaccine and was quoted as saying, I won't be rushing out to get my daughters vaccinated. But this is where it gets really interesting. So the first lady at that time, Jeanette Howard, who was married to John Howard, and you probably recognize Tony Blair, who was the PM of the UK at the time, actually had cervical cancer. And she was able to greatly influence her husband and able to effectively destigmatize the disease and create really one of the greatest vaccination campaigns in one country that we have ever seen. So much so that about 80% of the population plus in Australia is vaccinated against HPV. And many of the diseases that they see are now reportable, as you'll see shortly. And in fact, their public health experts are saying that they will eradicate cervical cancer in Australia probably in the next 20 years. It's amazing when you think about it. It goes back to the slide I showed you regarding smallpox. And so <clears throat> general warts, which is not cancer, but it's protected by two of the types in the vaccine. Um, basically in this study that was published by Dr. Ali in 2013, about the time when I met Basil Donovan, is that when the quadrivalent vaccine was introduced, they compared the group after the vaccine and before the vaccine in women, they saw a 93% reduction. This is all age dependent, obviously, in the rate of genital warts to the point where basically genital warts has been wiped out in the country of Australia. And in this study, only girls and women were vaccinated. So what about the guys, the dudes, the men in Australia? And what we saw in them, okay, in these males, heterosexual males, is almost an 82% reduction in men, right? So you all have now heard the terms of herd immunity over and over again. We've been using those terms for the last 50 years but this is a direct reflection of herd immunity. This is what happens when you vaccinate a certain percentage of the population. And once you get above that percent percentage, you passively protect the rest of the population. So this is probably the single best population example of that. And then similarly in the state of Australia, a uh, state of Victoria in Australia, what we're starting to see is a reduction in the rate of, of severely abnormal pap smears in women who are being screened. Already starting to see a reduction in the risk of cervical cancer and cervical precancer in the country of Australia based on this work by Julia Brotherton back in 2011. So this is really one of the, probably 
like the most important slide that I want you all to focus on. I'm very much about equity in terms of access to prevention and screening. Like I said, this is what I've dedicated my life to. And so this is a article that was published by Dr. Barbaro back in 2012. And on the left, in, if you remember, cervical cancer screening is covered in Australia and the state of Victoria, right? But just like the United States, the more likely you're, the more disadvantaged you are, the more likely you're not going to be screened, right? You can take this exact curve and actually basically extrapolate it to the United States right into my backyard. The more likely that you're, the less so, so, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged you are, the more likely you're going to be screened, right? Probably makes total sense to this group. What, when you look at vaccination status in Australia, in, in the state of Victoria, it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor. Everybody gets vaccinated. This is a school mandated vaccine that is very difficult to opt out, more difficult to opt out in, in their country. And as a consequence, that's why you see almost reasonably straight lines in these populations compared to women or girls that are being screened, okay? This is really important. This is how we normalize the issue related to cervical cancer prevention, particularly in this country, okay? And again, the problem is, is that we're doing a reasonably decent job. We could do better vaccinating industrialized nations. We got to do a lot better in sub-Saharan Africa, in South America, Latin America, Southeast Asia. These are areas where we have a serious problem. And this is the ongoing debate is how do we vaccinate better, which leads to the next slide, which I'm really excited about. So we now know that two doses can be used in a certain population, particularly younger girls and boys, instead of three doses. But what about one dose, okay? And again, this was the data that looked at whether between three doses, two doses, and one dose. And what you can see, and this is the, the tighter, I know this may be hard to interpolate for you all, but naturally affected individuals. But what we're learning here is that potentially one dose may be all that we need. And the analogy that I often give is, if you're building a fence in your back, backyard to make sure your dog doesn't get out, and let's say you have a, a pet chihuahua, you don't need to build a five foot fence, right? Because your dog's not gonna jump that high, right? So the question is, do we need to have a titer this high to be fully protective or is this titer high enough to be protective? And that's the exact question that we wanna start asking, right? And then based on the study by Amy Kramer and JNCI, what we'll see is that based on whether those, you get three doses, two doses or one dose, that we're seeing substantial levels of protection in women that are only getting one dose, which is why this has led to what's known as the Escudo study led by Dr. Kramer that, that's being conducted in Costa Rica to answer the question whether or not one dose can be the standard of care. And can you imagine that if we went into countries in sub-Saharan Africa and just gave one dose to girls and boys, the subsequent impact that would have on the reduction of cervical cancer mortality? it would be enormous, right? And again, there's no question that the vaccine makes a difference now, okay? This is one of the most heavily scrutinized vaccines in the history of vaccines, mainly because of the internet and social media. But I can tell you it's been scrutinized up and down. And again, there's very little downside to getting the vaccine. Most of the things that we've learned on Facebook related to things like it causes Guillain-Barre syndrome, that it causes premature ovarian failure, it causes people's hair to fall out. All of that stuff has been proven to be inaccurate. And again, I really think that we need to understand that this is an extremely safe vaccine. And we've been giving it since 2006. So I think that we have time to fully understand what the safety signals are, okay? So again, I'm going back to smallpox here. This is what smallpox looked like in endemic areas in 1945, pre-vaccination. And then you leapfrog over 20 years later, and that's what the endemic areas look like. And now the entire curve is basically, the graph is, or map is gray. There's no more smallpox. So the question I would ask this group, again, is why can't we do the exact same thing for cervical cancer? And again, many years ago, back in 2014, I was asked to testify in front of the United Nations uh, to talk about cervical cancer prevention. So this is just a picture of me at the UN building at a general assembly talking about cervical prevention worldwide. So anyway, so that's the goal. The World Health Organization very much wants us to accelerate the elimination plan. So you're gonna be hearing a lot about this going forward.
And la very quickly, I just want to talk about this because these are controversial issues that I personally think that the screening interval is a little bit too long. <clears throat> and the reason being is that we don't have good recall call mechanisms for patients to come back in for their screening. And considering the healthcare system that we have, I'm worried about losing patients to the screening equation. So I just think this is a little bit long. I think the interval is scientifically correct. They're just, it's just not practical, at least for the United States. And then lastly, we published some work with one of my fellows that we discovered that one in five women in the United States are diagnosed with cervical cancer after the age of 65. And for those who are on Medicare, it's very difficult to get cervical cancer screening covered unless you have a special approval. And so I've been begging the screening authorities to revisit this and they are, but again, I think it's, it's not the right thing to tell women that they don't need to be screened after 65 years of age. So here are my final thoughts and conclusions. I wanna make sure that we take enough question, time for questions. One is that I'm just asking you all to think about um, as an advocacy group that you really should promote HPV testing either by itself or with cytology as a part of the screening paradigm in 2022. I'm telling you, eventually cytology will go away. And I have an ongoing bet with a good dear colleague of mine is I predict that cervical cancer screening will go away entirely in 25 years in this country. That's just my, that, that's my prediction. Again, and keep in mind that if we screened and treated at acceptable rates in this country, that you actually don't need HPV vaccination against for cervical cancer prevention to get, to be honest with you. One of the problems is that we still don't screen women properly. I'll tell you this fact. Back in 1998, the NCI published a report whereby 60 to 65% of women in this country were unscreened or underscreened. I just published a report with the CDC last year that demonstrates what those numbers are now in this current decade. It's exactly the same. 60% of women in this country are underscreened or unscreened. So if we just screen properly and manage them properly, we would actually have extraordinarily low rates of cervical cancer and, and vaccination almost wouldn't be needed in the United States. Okay, and, and the last two bullet points, Again, the population impact of vaccination has been enormous, okay? And again, we need to continue to advocate for vaccination. And thankfully that number goes up every single year. But we also must not forget about the people in this country who have not been vaccinated. And what's really troubling and really frustrating to me is saying, oh, we've got cervical cancer solved. Well, what about like the 50 million women in this country who have not been vaccinated? They still need care too. So let's not forget about those women that actually need screening, they need our attention, they need this awareness, and they need access to care. So anyway, so I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I wanna make sure that we have enough time to answer questions and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, I learned so much from this talk. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, let's go ahead and start the Q&A. You can still submit questions at the bottom of the screen. We will try to get through all the submitted questions, but we might not be able to due to time constraints. Um, so the first question I see is, what are some steps that can be taken to initiate a conversation with someone who mistrusts the healthcare system about getting screened for cervical cancer? Yeah, you know, um... Well, one is that I think that there are a lot of groups now on social media as well as the internet that have fairly accurate information about the goals of cervical cancer screening. Obviously, there's a lot of inaccurate stuff, but the groups that we trust have really good stuff out there, whether it's the American Cancer Society, the CDC, the American College of OBGYN, the Society of Gynecological Oncology, ASCCP, there are tons of groups. But it's really to get the messaging out that screening is really, you know, is really fundamentally one of the most important things that people do in terms of reducing their risk. And, you know, and so not to be so much guarded about getting screened, the, the thing that you really should get guarded about is what you should do if you have a positive test. And that's a different question for a different time. But going back to what I said earlier, if you're screened, particularly with an HPV-based test, that individual woman should feel extraordinarily reassured 
that they're at very low risk for having cervical cancer in their future. In fact, what I'll tell you is that if a, three, if a woman has three consecutive negative HPV tests, you almost via modeling can tell that woman that they don't need to be screened ever again because their risk of getting cervical cancer is zero, okay? So I just don't want women to be fearful of screening. And again, like I mentioned, 90% of women in this country will screen negative. I would think most women would want to know what their screening status is so they could feel better about themselves going forward. So, uh, Despite the screening guidelines for cervical cancer, why do you think many gynecologists continue to give annual pap smears during their yearly exams? Um, well, this is a tricky, this is a tricky one to answer. One is um, it's, you know, I, I don't mean this in a, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but sometimes it's, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And like I, like I said, I think people are comfortable with the annual yearly pap. And so they just stick with that and they're comfortable with it. And as long as they can get the pap paid for, why change? That's one reason. The second reason is I think a lot of women and patients expect to be screened yearly. And so when they don't get screened yearly, they feel like they're getting shortchanged despite the education, or maybe they're not getting the education and we need to have more forums like this. The third one is some of it is financially driven, right? And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, cervical cancer screening and, and women's health, the intersection or the, the adjoining of the two is the PAP. So when we said women needed a pap every year, that meant women came in every year. So if you take the pap away, then do they need to come in every year for their annual exam? The, and the answer is yes, they do. But the pap shouldn't be the thing that anchors that annual exam or that an, annual visit, okay? So there is a little bit of a financial disincentive that if you tell women that they only need to come in every three or five years, what happens to that provider who's seeing fewer, fewer patients? So I think that those, I think, are the three main reasons. Mm. And then the fourth one maybe is that there's a little bit of mistrust. They don't understand the data, but I think that's the main reason. And what instances is more frequent screening warranted? Yeah, so more frequent screening, that's a good question. So much of what I talked about in my talk is for the relatively the low risk to average risk woman. And you're asking like, what does that mean, low risk or average risk? So to make it simpler, I think women who are immunocompromised, <clears throat> so let's say that women who are HIV positive or women who have undergone a solid organ transplant or women that have a history of lupus, rheumatoid, um, Crohn's disease, people who are on monoclonal antibody therapy, those women are women that probably need to be screened more frequently because they do have a slightly higher risk. And, that's, and we actually have guidelines on that from the ASCCP but those are women, but, but particularly, I think the group that we are, mo we focus a lot of time on are HIV positive women, but that the CDC has been very clear on how to screen those women. So I think that's how we def just kind of split between those groups. Gotcha. Um, in what ways do you think screening plays a role in cervical cancer disparities? And what about the HPV vaccine? Well, I think that um, there's no question so there's no question, if you look at a heat map of the United States of areas that are the rates of screening, so obviously the rates of under screening, you could take that same heat map and just cross out screening and put in HPV vaccination, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to recant a, a, a really poignant story that I think that this group will it'll resonate with. So in the state of Alabama, we call cervical cancer mama's disease. And the reason we call it mama's disease is that most women in the state, many women in the state, when they have their babies, they have Medicaid. And when does Medicaid expire? It usually expires about six weeks after they have their baby. And once they lose that health care, they basically leave the system and they never come back in and get screened because they can't afford to come back in. And then bam, 20 to 25 years later, they get cervical cancer. And thus why we call it mama's disease. Very similarly, if women wind up getting a tubal ligation, they are they you know they often have to come in to see their gynecologist to get birth control, and that usually means getting a pap. They equate that with never having to come back into their gynecologist again, and those women are actually at risk for cervical cancer. So there there is 
significant health equity and disparity issues across the country when it comes to cervical cancer. We also know that African Black women are actually a much higher risk for developing cervical cancer. That's not fully explained just by screening or the absence of screening or underscreen, but their mortality is higher, which I think that there's a clear biological index or explanation for that. But cervical cancer is a model disease of where there's significant inequities in terms of access to screening, but more importantly, and this is beyond the scope of this presentation, access to treatment and evaluation. In some ways, I would argue the screening piece is easy. The hard piece is getting them in for a biopsy and getting them treated and getting them seen by an expert. You don't reduce the risk of cervical cancer when you only have a piece of the equation, AKA screening. You need to have the entire picture in front of you, basically. Right. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Um, after you've had cervical cancer, should you continue to get tested for HPV and or continue to get a pap smear? So this is a really controversial question because um, our surveillance guidelines, particularly from the Society of Gynecological Oncology, are very loosey-goosey on this, mainly because we don't know really how much value the PAP or HPV test adds to screening women who have been diagnosed with cervical cancer as part of the surveillance process. And in fact, I will tell you personally, I've stopped doing them because I don't think I've ever picked up a cervical cancer or I mean a recurrence of a cervical cancer earlier with a PAP or HPV test than just doing a careful GYN exam and looking at their female organs or looking at their vaginal area. There are a lot of gynecologic oncologists that do it. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I think for the person asking the question, I think you have to understand that the, the value of it is highly limited at best. Mm, I see. What type of doctor provides the HPV vaccination for teens? So it's usually a pediatrician. So 95% of the vaccines are given by uh, pediatricians or pediatric providers, like nurse practitioners or physician assistants. The remaining 5% are really given by, um, by like family practice people and by gynecologists. But I think the more important thing to recognize is the minority of vaccinations in this country are given by OBGYNs. What are the type of vaccines that you're referring to? Yeah, so there's only, well, this is easy because there's only one vaccine that's commercial available in the United States and that's uh, the non-avalent vaccine. It goes under the trade name Gardasil 9 made by Merck. That's the only vaccine that's available, okay? And um, so again, I, what's different between Gardasil 9 and Gardasil 4, which you can't get anymore in this country is that there's seven types in that vaccine that protect against cervical cancer. And at least in this country, that that protects against about 90 to 92% of the types that are attributable to cervical cancer in the United States. So it's highly protective. And as I think we vaccinate more and more girls and boys, I do think that we're gonna to get to a point where hopefully screening won't be necessary. So can you get the HPV vaccine after you've had HPV? Yes, absolutely. So that's okay. actually a great question. So first off, the, men, the like less than, I think like one to 3% of the population of women actually will have, um, will have actually all of the types, I think it's less than 1%, will have all the types contained within the HPV vaccine, right? So if you're HPV positive, there's a good chance that you're gonna be protected against the other types that the vaccine covers, right? And so the thing that we talk about a lot now is, should you offer the vaccine to a woman who's been treated for an abnormal pap smear? And my answer is absolutely yes. Why? I mean, there's all, I mean, the, the, the vaccine is so safe, there's little downside to it. And if it affords you additional protection, you should go for it. And I think a woman who's been evaluated for an abnormal PAP can best identify the value of not having to go through that process all over again. Yeah. Even after cervical cancer or just after HPV? Well, so. Probably either, to be honest with you, but definitely for women that have pre-cancer, there's no question. Uh, again, I think there's a little downside with, with cancer, but, um, but again, it's, we see this, this discussion come up more on the pre-cancer side than the cancer side, so. Um, let's see. 
Uh, even if you've had HPV, can the vaccine prevent genital warts? Even if you have HPV, yes. <clears throat> because again, so genital warts are caused by type six and 11. HPV type six and 11. And so as you know, you know, if you haven't been exposed to type six and 11 before you've been vaccinated, there's a reasonable expectation that you'll be protected against six and 11 and thus protect you from general warts. Okay. Um, can one be diagnosed with cervical cancer if they're post hysterectomy? Well, so the answer is maybe. So it depends on what kind of hysterectomy you had. So if you had what we call in the medical profession, a total, total hysterectomy, um, in, the, in the community, they sometimes call it a partial hysterectomy with removal of the cervix, then it's really impossible for you to get cervical cancer because the cervical, cervix has been removed. But if you have had what we call a subtotal or a super cervical hysterectomy where the cervix is left behind, and that, that cervix is left behind for multiple different reasons, then yes, you can develop cervical cancer. And to keep in mind, it's important as a woman that you ask whether you still have your cervix, because I've taken care of patients who did not know they had a cervix left behind by their prior surgeon, and they've gone on to develop, unfortunately, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. But the question is actually a really good question. So if you had a hysterectomy, please confirm with your gynecologist that your cervix was removed. That's actually, mm -hmm. sounds basic, but it's actually very important. Yeah. Um... What is the most ideal age to get the HPV vaccine? So the most ideal age is 11 and 12. That's what we're recommending. It's a two dose regimen. And part of it is just because, you know, we know that the immune response is going to be potentially its highest at that point, but also it's most effective before adolescence becomes sexually active. So the, the, the earlier you can give it before sexual activity, the better. And we do know that once a woman becomes sexually active, the efficacy of the vaccine drops pre uh, precipitously. Okay. And, 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 what, and what age would you suggest getting the vaccine uh, up until? Um, well, again, as I mentioned, it's, up, it's approved up to 45 years of age. So. Okay. Um, I, I got to sign off for another call. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends and the link will be sent to the follow-up email. Again, thank you so much. This has been wonderful today. A pleasure. I hope someone, I hope you all learned something from the talk. Thank you again for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.